Hello again, folks. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. So today I'm going to continue my series on the Dungeon of the Mad Mage level two. And this is going to be, you know, the second part of my last video was on some of the encounters that your players uh, would have uh, on this level and ideas about those encounters in terms of if you're going to actually run the module, but also if you're going to homebrew your own dungeons, you know, ideas that you get from this. I did areas one through 13 last time. Now, or actually through 12, now I'm going to do 13 through 26. So let's get started. All right, as I said, we left off in the hallways of area 12. Uh, so let's move numerically uh, to area 13. And this is a very important area in terms of thinking about dungeons with multiple you know, access points, multiple routes that the players can take to get to the same place. Because as you can see, 13A is accessible from this chute that I have in red uh, from room 7C, because it's possible that the players could just come down here through room 2A, which is just a well, cut across area 7, and then come out in the chute, and here they have. And they've only had an encounter potentially with Trenzia's forces. You know, and similarly, the players could go through the marketplace in area 1, come down 8, come around, and back up without encountering nearly what they would do if they went through, you know, areas 9 and 10. Just as it's possible the players could explore Calabash's area to, you know, go up here, uh, find the harpsichord room, you know, the gate room. And what all these alternate routes tell me as a dungeon designer is to watch out for having items or bits of knowledge in areas of your dungeon that are absolutely essential for the players to get through something like the old adventure game, you know, computer games. It's okay to get, give players, you know, some information or items that helps them along the way. But if you have something that they're absolutely stopped dead in their tracks and they have to go back and they have to discover, you know, some secret door or something, it can really screw up the fun of running through a dungeon. And the designers do that here uh, everywhere, except one point that I'll make later. So for example, in room four, which is an old Xanathar post, you have uh, the password that lets the bugbears let you through hallway number nine, but you don't absolutely have to have that because there's nothing here that prevents the players from exploring every you know hallway and chamber on this dungeon. And you know I'm from the old school, so we always did explore you know every chamber, every dungeon because we wanted whatever treasure there might be. Just don't make it absolutely necessary. So area 13 is the home to Nothics and gibbering mouthers that are the remains of Halister's apprentices who went mad. And 13A contains one such gibbering mouther along with a bunch of trash and stuff. And the gibbering mouther's biggest weakness is its very slow movement rate, only 10 feet per turn. The players can use range attacks uh, to weaken it before actually engaging it. So the thing about a gibbering mouther is its effects are kind of deadly with a low DC. So for example, it has the gibbering mouther hypnotic effect, DC 10, then a 10 foot radius around it. The terrain can be difficult and whatnot. Again, DC 10 on strength check. But what happens is the hypnotic thing, basically you're just confused. Uh, you have to make this, you know, each turn that you're in its radius. It isn't like you, you make the save and then you're immune for it for 24 hours or anything. If you do blow the thing on its radius thing, you're held fast. And then it has this spit thing that it can go 15 feet, uh, which blinds everyone at a five foot uh, diameter around this. And that's got a DC 13. So again, maybe everyone's gonna make them you know, as time goes by. You know, I like most 5e monsters, it has a lot of hit points. So it could be two or three rounds of fighting one gibbering mouther. Here's another thing, there's kind of some goofy treasure in room 13A. So you've got all these overturned mine carts and stuff from the days, you know, hundreds of years ago when the dwarves mined this. And you have three chunks of mithril that are 10 pounds a piece and are set in the text to be worth 25 gold. Now, I found this to be rather curious because we think of mithril as rare and valuable, and yet it's only worth two and a half gold pieces per pound. You know, a lump of gold is worth 50 gold pieces per pound. Now, I've seen threads, you know, where people say, well, mithril should be worth 50 times as much as gold or, you know, even 10 or 20, which would make a 10 pound chunk worth either five or 10,000 gold. So if you want to go with, you know, mithril being rare, maybe have a, a smaller chunk. 
But here's the other strange thing. So you've got people coming through the yawning portal all the time, paying a fee to be lowered into the dungeon. So this is almost like a tourist attraction, a deadly one. And these chunks of mithril are just lying in these overturned carts. I find it strange that no one has ever noticed them before. It's not like you had to go through a secret door or something to find them. Here again, you have the problem with a static dungeon versus dynamic. because Everything is just set up for the players to find it. It's static, but it doesn't really make sense in terms of people coming through here. Now, you could just use the old Halister card and say, well, they just beamed in the mithril right before the players came. Okay, but... It's a little lazy. Now there's another little weird twist in room 13A. You have up here in this corner, this three foot high red polished stone that's been defaced by all sorts of goblin handprints and you know maybe some graffiti or whatnot. And if the players decide to clean off uh, these handprints and anything else, uh, restore it to its order, the dwarven god Dumathoin will grant them the ability to see all secret doors for 24 hours. That's a nice ability. But you know, I have a little bit of a problem with this. Not that Dumathoin couldn't grant this power, he's a god after all, but that the players would just sort of say they'd see this, you know, altar or whatever and decide to clean it all off. And if they did do this, I'm sort of like, did you read this module? You know, did you hear from someone who ran in the Mad Mage? Because I just don't know if players always do that. You know, and so if I'm going to do something like this, I'm going to give some clues because I just don't expect players to do this sort of thing, to clean off altars and think they don't know what God is this necessarily. It doesn't say that anywhere in the text. So I just wouldn't expect them necessarily to do that. Now, maybe that's why it's such a boon, you know, ability 24 hours to see all secret doors because it's such a rare occurrence, but then why do that? All right, so 13B has this wall of uh, bones and, you know, old rusty armor that goes almost up to the ceiling. I talked about it a little bit when I said placing objects uh, in this dungeon. And the idea here is the players have to cross this. And what it does is it warns these four Nothics that are in room 13E to come in and attack. Once again, more of Halister's insane former apprentices. Uh, it does say in the text they just attack whatever. Four Nothics with their rotting gaze is pretty nasty, except that it does say they're very frightened of spellcasters. If they realize there's one or more in the party, they may attempt to parlay. They may tell the players, hey, there's this drow mage across the way here uh, with these uh, were rats. You should go over and mess with them. And before we go into area 14, I want to talk about 13F, which is a classic resource drain where you have four gibbering mouthers. Now we talked about the limitation of the mouthers with the 10 foot movement, but notice the structure here with these caverns. Could the gibbering mouthers place themselves such a way that they can get the players in close range? So now you've got almost 200 hit points worth of monsters. You've got four creatures uh, that have the gibbering mouther hip hypnotic ability, uh, you know, the spit deal, and the terrain all around them in 10 foot diameter is, can potentially hold them fast. Again, low DC, but you know, you're going to start blowing saving throws. So if the players don't weaken the Mouthers with, you know, ranged attacks or something, either it's going to, you know, take a ton of hit points and spells away, or it could start to get a little disastrous. And then in 13G, we have an, a battle that's going on just as the players enter the room. It's the last of the fine fellows of Daggerford. This is Rex the Hammer. He's this warrior. He's fighting a Mezeloth and two Nothics. And there's three dead Nothics uh, on the floor. Now, what the text says is that Rex is down to 22 hit points. It doesn't say anything about the Mesoloth or the Nothics. You know, are they at full hit points? Because if so, this is another battle that can turn, you know, kind of deadly because, you know, Mesoloths can really be a pain in the ass, potentially. And I say potentially because they do have a seven intelligence, so you wonder well, what are their battle tactics. But they want to survive. They're going to use their abilities, which includes two darknesses a day, two dispel magics, which... Against spellcasters, that can be deadly. And once per day, a cloud kill. They have a nice armor class, 18. Uh, they have a lot of hit points. And as an action, they can teleport 60 feet. The other thing is, what if you have the Heleth, the Revenant from level one, who wants to, you know, the fine fellows beat him to death through him in this pit. He wants to kill them all. If he comes into the room, does he attack Rex? And the thing about Rex is, as all these other, you know, fine fellows, is they are evil, which I think is problematic for me. Why rescue NPCs that are evil? They're only going to cause trouble. If you want to make them edgy, 
on your own world, you know, make them neutral or something. Because they're not that useful in terms of what they give. I mean, the one thing is Keelum, uh, the spy that they rescue from the Grixon level one, does have a nice spell book. Uh, but that's about it. All right, so next we go to area 14 where you have Rizaril, this drow mage. He's one of the power centers on this level. You've also got, you know, the goblins up in Marketplace in area one. Uh, you've got the Xanathar watch post in area nine. And then you've got another Xanathar post in area 20. But Rizuril is opposed to Xanathar. He's with uh, two other houses in Waterdeep. Not important what those are. The point is he wants to, you know, get rid of the Xanathar posts. And the thing about it is this is an encounter that could be more negotiation and whatnot than actual battle. You know, Rizuril is a mage. He's got a nice spell book, which the players could take uh, if they defeated him. Lots of spell books on these levels. But, you know, again, he has these eight werewolves and he has a quasit. Quasits can be really irritating, right? Because uh, they have, uh, they can turn invisible at will. They have this scare ability. You know, it's only a DC 10, but you never know when you're going to roll bad. But, you know, Rizzarol, again, wants this Xanathar thing. He wants, you know, they, they say in the text he would make a deal with the head of Shun and Nadia the Berserker, who's in Area 20. We'll talk more about her. Uh, he has this stone key that he's not sure about, this giant 10-pound dwarven stone key that uh, gives access to gates on levels 6 and 8. He also has this symbol uh, that uh, passes, allows the players to pass through this deadly 20A room in the first room in area 20. And this is a critical thing. Uh, so I think it's worthwhile for the players to make this deal or defeat him, you know, and figure out what this symbol is, as we'll see. There's also another interesting little device uh, in Area 14. In 14b, the Were-Rats have assembled this complete map of Level 2. I think maybe the Dwarves made it or something because it's made out of these giant stone things. You can't move it anywhere. It gets destroyed. But it gives you a sense of this entire dungeon. And this is really useful to the players because if they, you know, avoided an area, they came straight through here on some circuitous route or, you know, right through 2a into the Area 7 or whatever, they can see, look at all the areas we missed. And they can also see the geography. If you look at the hallways around room five, the players are like, why is there that big, you know, rectangle around there? What could be there? Maybe a secret door. Because the map doesn't contain any secret doors or secret rooms. Something to think about for your own dungeons. All right, so rooms 15 and 16 have nothing of real interest. And 17 and 18 are more, you know, resource drains. In 17, you have two rust monsters fighting over an old helm. Uh, they will ignore the players the first time they go through this hallway, but when they come back, as they'll have to, they will attack the players. Rust monsters are a tremendous pain in the ass. You know, weapons striking them, ruined. How many do you have? The idea is to take a, a, along the walls here are uh, torch holders. You can take them and distract uh, the rust monsters. And then room 18 is this old cold storage room used by the dwarves that the Halister has turned into this screw job room where... Any magic you use, and it has these big dwarven runes on the wall, right? So if you do a detect magic or anything, the cold storage affects uh, 8d8 cold damage, no save. No treasure, no information, you're screwed. So area 19 is large, um, quite a few rooms, and it's dominated by giant spiders, which, you know, the old school players always hated giant spiders because of their poison. You get paralyzed and whatnot. You know, they slow down the party or even cause death. As usual, the hallways up here are clogged with spider webs, very difficult to move through. You've got to hack or, you know, use a torch. And then these spiders see what's happening as spiders everywhere do with their webs and they come and attack. And what's kind of interesting is the only treasure is down in room 19B. It's a ring of swimming. It allows you to swim at 40 feet. It's okay. So you could, you know, come this way, say, oh, I'm staying out of the webs, go to these other areas where there's some dead spiders, get the ring of swimming and move on potentially. But if you do decide, well, the big treasure must be with the giant spiders, you go in there and you fight them. You get 20 copper, 18 silver, 5 gold, and a silvered dagger. Kind of a screw job. Area 20 is totally interesting. It's a Xanathar watch post. And 20A has a beholder zombie. It will attack anyone who enters without that symbol that Rizzarol had on the non-magic wand. And, you know, beholder zombies, there's a one in four chance when it uses its eye stalk that it's a disintegrate. And let me tell you, that's a 10d8 damage. If you blow that save and you're a low hit point, you know, a character, say a wizard, 
you could be dead dead, a pile of dust. And the thing is, any sounds of battle uh, with the zombie, which the room is 20 feet tall, so it's hovering up here at 20 feet, brings in Nadia, this berserker, uh, and she's got five thugs and five bugbears. So I think that this encounter, you know, has the potential of a total party kill if you've got, you know, what's recommended is four six level characters because what shape are they in when they enter this room? Because if, you know, let's say you come down from, you know, hallway number eight, and you, but you fought, you made your way through the, you know, marketplace with the goblins, uh, you know, nine with Shun, the, the drow mage, you know, you've, you've fought the oozes, now you're here, you've used a lot of spell, maybe you've downed hit points, and, you know, this is a nasty battle. That berserker uh, and her crew are going to fight you to the death, and that beholder's up there uh, 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 blasting away. But if you notice, all the other routes that lead to Area 20 take you past Room 14 with Rizzerol and his symbol that allows you to get through the Beholder Room. And in addition, since he wants the players uh, to defeat Nadia, he might give them some information. And also, I don't know whether you just have to have this wand. You know, it says in there, anyone wearing the symbol, presumably Nadia and her crew, are ignored uh, by the Beholder. And in fact, I don't think Rizral would give up uh, his wand with the symbol. He might just tell the players, you know, to draw this on there, your shields or something on your cloak, to tell the Beholder zombie, hey, they're friends. So I think this route down uh, Hallway 8, this kind of shortcut that just kind of goes through Area 20, is for later, you know, expeditions. You've cleared out a lot of the dungeon, especially this uh, Xanathar post, to make a quick move to get down to level 3. All right, then in this big long hallway uh, of number 21, you have these two animated ballistas. Uh, they've got blind sense of 120 feet. It goes 60 more feet, so they're not going to see the players right away. Uh, but if the players come down here and then they throw these fire bolts at them, if the players try to back away, they're animated, they can inch forward to continue to blast the players. And what are these ballistas guarding? This is this ancient uh, dwarven brewery that I call the Ale House of Screwjabs. Why, you ask? Well, you have the potential to fight a green slime, another beholder zombie, three mimics, and you have to navigate this hallway with pit traps that do bludgeoning damage and they snap shut. They're very difficult to get back open. And what is this all for? You have three tankards worth five gold apiece. And then you have magically preserved 97 barrels of this dwarven ale. And each barrel is worth 40 gold pieces. And you're like, well, wait a minute, that's almost 4,000 in gold. Isn't that worth it? Well, the barrels are 400 pounds a piece. So how do you get them out? You can't teleport anything in here. You know, you can't, you know, telekinesis. You could levitate them maybe uh, one barrel at a time and take it back out. You could bring a crew down here of NPCs, you know, helpers. But again, you're in the dungeon of the Mad Mage. Things are always, you know, Halister's teleporting them in or whatnot. It's very deadly to try to run an operation. Hence why no one's done it. All right, so as I mentioned, Room 23 is for atmosphere. These five skeletons uh, of various dragons that have been wired up. They sort of like the dinosaur exhibit at the Natural History Museum. And Room 24 has a skeleton of an old adventurer that can communicate some information if the players use a speak with dead spell. But, you know, here again, how often one do you use a speak with dead with every skeleton that you find? I guess maybe the way it's positioned or something. But unless you're, you know, a bard has a speak with dead, they're probably not going to have that. And then a cleric, of course, can, you know, the next day, you know, get a speak with dead. But you got to come back and gonna rest here or something overnight, maybe. So if you don't have clues that suggest, hey, you should use a speak dead, speak with dead, then it's probably not going to happen. And even the information that the dead adventurer has, oh, there's a secret door to an elven tomb, but I don't really remember where it is, is okay. All right, then room 25, and I mentioned this when I was doing my placing objects, you have all these petrified uh, creatures in these alcoves beyond. And in room 25, you have these four caryatids, these, you know, animated columns. And you also have this modron that circles around them. Halister uh, has taken it, call it, I think, Halistron or something. And basically its job is to, you know, guard uh, these caryatids from any kind of damage, but it can tell the players what they do, which is cool because it can tell you the magic phrase to activate the caryatids. Anything in between these four columns, this 
magic appears and it removes conditions. And these conditions include blinded, deafened, stunned, poisoned, and most importantly, petrification. Why? Because as I said, in these alcoves on the secondary section are all these petrified figures that Hallister has left here. And they run from the benign, you know, four goats to the super deadly, a mind flare. And behind this secret door at the end of the hallway is a statue uh, of Hallister himself. And if you, you know, use the karyatids or some spell, he comes to life. It basically just says fools and then disappears. It's a game. A lot of text says that each of these creatures, if it's, you know, unpetrified, you know, acts according to its nature. That you notice this last one is a human, but actually it's a were-rat in human form. He may want to work with the players. N none of the other ones, a lot of them just attack the players and they might know that, especially if they do one. I think though this idea is great because how often, first of all, you go to like a Medusa's lair or something and there's all these statues and everything. You're not going to have that many greater restorations or anything to, that, that you know, maybe a wand or something, but really, but there's a lot of opportunities here in some petrification area if you have a device like this. It's a really good idea. All right, and the final area is area 26, which is the remains of a very ancient elven tomb that Hallister has repurposed for his, you know, work areas. Uh, and you see that in 26D, he's got these slabs that are uh, used for bloodletting. So in room 26A, you've got two owl bears that are uh, guarding a pot of awakening. You put a plant in there, let it grow, it becomes an animated uh, or awakened shrub. And in 26C, you've just got smashed uh, furniture. Apparently, the owl bears have smashed something. Secret door to 26B, but actually, you, you, turns out it's a fake tomb. And then you've got this hallway here, which has a trap that Hallister has set. This 10-foot diameter uh, rock sphere that looks like an eyeball comes back and forth down the hallway, smashing anyone with 10d10 bludgeoning damage. So you have to disable the pressure plate or somehow actually try to stop the thing from rolling. You're going to take some damage if you do that. And then finally, Area 26 ends in this old study where you find some old, you know, dust of disappearance, not bad, and another nice spell book. There's quite a few on this level. All right, so there you have the remaining encounters that are on level two of the Dungeon of the Mad Mage with some ideas about running them or, you know, adapting them for your own campaign. So I'm going to have one more in my series on level two, and this is kind of go overview the kind of the GM tips and secrets and concepts that you can learn from this level. But until then, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments because I love to, you know, read them and respond. And most importantly, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.